Hi, I'm Dr. Rich Sherman, and I'm going to tell you what biofeedback is and what it's used for. I've been doing biofeedback for over 30 years, both as a researcher and as a clinician, so I know a good bit about it. In this talk, you're going to hear just a few highlights. Not enough to know how to do biofeedback, but to give you an idea of what it's like. This is a typical biofeedback device. It has sockets on the front for sensor lines to come in. For example, this is a sensor that picks up skin temperature. The signal has to go out and it goes to a computer. So there's a typical biofeedback display on the computer. It's picking up temperature. If I warm up the sensor, you can see the response on the computer. People learn from the display what their skin temperature is and how to control it. Biofeedback is not magic. Standard recording devices are used to identify physiological systems such as muscle tension and breathing which are not performing the way they should for whatever you're trying to do. They identify patterns and levels of function which lead to pain, anxiety, and other problems. During biofeedback, one of the physiological systems that was already identified as not working correctly is recorded. Levels and patterns of function for that system are shown to the patient as they're being made in real time. The patient and any therapist or coach who may be present can use this information to help correct abnormal patterns and levels of function. Other psychophysiological interventions, such as relaxation training, can be combined with biofeedback or used as home practice. Biofeedback is a teaching technique. This child's fingertip temperature is being recorded. You can see the little sensor taped onto her finger. She's watching the screen to relate changes in sensations from her finger to changes in hand temperature, which correlates with near surface blood flow. She's being coached to make changes in a direction which will increase blood flow. Biofeedback helps people recognize how a physiological system, such as blood pressure or temperature, is functioning and learn to form a habit of controlling the system so it works optimally for any particular conditions. Psychophysiology and biofeedback are used in many settings including diagnosis and treatment of clinical problems, education, performance enhancement, business, and of course just plain self-exploration. Professions incorporating psychophysiology and biofeedback into their work include teachers, physicians, nurses, and PAs, psychologists, therapists, and counselors, physical and occupational therapists, physiotherapists, corporate trainers, coaches, and many others. Please remember that these people all work with the types of clients they're trained to work with. A teacher would not go ahead and attempt to treat a diagnosed disease unless that teacher was being directly supervised by an appropriately trained clinician. And an appropriately trained clinician would not attempt to work with students the way a teacher would unless that person had extra training. Biofeedback is performed in schools, offices, homes, clinics, hospitals, 
work and sports environments and lots of other places. These biofeedback units are designed so that they can stand alone. They don't necessarily need a computer to show the biofeedback display. Biofeedback devices don't have to be electronic and they don't have to be expensive or complicated. For example, this is a thermometer which is worn on a finger to detect stress responses. It's used for home practice and as a physiological awareness aid. The next few slides discuss the signals we record and how we actually make the recordings. Physiological signals frequently recorded for biofeedback include respiration, heart rate, muscle tension, sweating, skin temperature, brain waves. When brain waves are fed back, the process is frequently called neurofeedback. Here's a typical respiration sensor. It wraps around the chest with a Velcro band, and as you breathe in and out, this little elastic part stretches and contracts. We use this to show people respiration patterns as they're breathing, so they can learn to control it. And notice that I've also got an audio signal going on so people can listen as well as look at the display. Recording muscle tension. In this example, the surface electromyographic representation of muscle tension is being recorded from three sensors pasted over the muscle. Muscles make electricity. As they become tenser, they make even more electricity. When a muscle is tensed, you can see that the signal gets higher, which means more electricity, and has different waveforms. I'm wearing a sensor that picks up muscle tension from my entire head especially the forehead and the jaws. So when I wrinkle my forehead, you'll see the signal go up. So here we go. So there's my forehead wrinkling. And when I tense my jaws, there it goes again. So again, this is picking up muscle tension from my entire head. This amputee is about to have SEMG sensors placed on her thighs. She reports having intermittent cramping phantom limb pain. In the recording below, the upper signal is from her intact thigh while the lower signal is from about the same position on her residual limb. You can see the spasms in her stump as the EMG signal changes. Note the lack of any corresponding change in the signal from the intact limb. Recording brain waves. The brain's electrical activity, EEG, is recorded from sensors mounted on the surface over various parts of the brain. Here are some typical brainwave patterns of interest to people who are doing EEG biofeedback. So at the top we see beta, which is a very high frequency wave but low amplitude. Then we have pure alpha, which you really don't see that often. Looks kind of like spindles at a higher amount of electricity than beta. 
but a little slower. Just below that is what you're more likely to see, which is alpha mixed with other waves. And then there's theta. It's very important that you realize that different parts of the brain produce different waves all the time. So the waves you see depend on where you're recording from. Relationships between brain waves and behavior. When recording from any one area of the brain, most of the brain waves are there, but at any one time, one of the waves predominates. If the front of the brain is producing mostly alpha waves, sometimes called being in an alpha state, the person is likely to be quietly introspective. But if it is producing mostly delta waves, the person will probably be asleep. Performing different tasks usually results in a predictable pattern of brain waves in various parts of the brain. If the normal pattern is not present, this may mean that the person is having a problem. For example, most children with ADHD have too much of one type of wave and too little of another. If the child is shown his or her brain wave patterns and taught to correct the amounts of the brain waves using neurofeedback, ADHD is very likely to decrease in severity or go away. Why should teaching people to change their brain waves affect underlying problems? People who do neurofeedback generally feel that the parts of the brain generating abnormal proportions of brain waves can be taught to function normally by teaching the brain to produce the correct normal proportions of brain waves. Theoretically, the more normal the brain waves are, the more the problem should resolve. Thus, the treatment success is proportional to how well the person learns to normalize his or her brain waves. These are typical sensors for recording heart rate. The one on the lower left records EKG from the wrists using what looks like SEMG sensors. The one on the right picks up your pulse from your fingertip. heart rate variability. The heart does not beat steadily. Rather, its rate changes all the time. It speeds up with exercise, excitement, and stress. It slows with relaxation and sleep. Your heart rate also changes as you breathe in and out. If your heart rate does not change when you breathe in and out, it is likely that you're very sick. The lack of heart rate variability is closely associated with future severe illness. If people with poor heart rate variability are trained to increase it by watching variability on a computer monitor, in other words, biofeedback, symptoms of such disorders as irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, and non-cardiac chest pain can be greatly reduced. Here's an example of heart rate variability biofeedback being given actually to me. At the top is respiration. You can see me breathing in and out. And at the bottom is heart rate. So that's not um, just beats. That's how fast my heart is beating from beat to beat. Heart rate and inspiration should increase approximately together. And as you can see, just initially they don't, <clears throat> but as soon as I start being able to really attend to uh, the feedback instead of whether I've hooked myself up correctly, you can see they begin to come into alignment. This is the M-Wave heart rate variability biofeedback device. It uses photoplethysmographic sensors on the front of the device or in the ear clip to pick up the heartbeat. 
The software analyzes the beat-to-beat -beat interval and feeds it back using the lights and bar at the top of the unit. No computer is needed to use this device. The display is incredibly easy to understand. Just keep the upper right light green and you have it. The rest of the display guides you towards achieving this goal. I'm wearing sensors on my fingertips which pick up how much I'm sweating. Sweat is mostly salt water. The biofeedback device is sending a tiny electrical signal from one sensor to another across my skin. As I sweat more, more signal can get across. As I get nervous, I sweat more. Well, I'm already pretty nervous, so this isn't going to go up, but sometimes I can set off a little reaction. There we go. So that's the equivalent of sweating more. It's a reflex. Psychophysiological profiles are discussed through the next few slides. A typical psychophysiological assessment is the stress response psychophysiological profile. Its aims are to identify which physiological parameters are responsive to stressors related to the patient's problems. Use stress responsive physiological parameters to identify stressors which the patient may not be aware of. Monitor the magnitude of change in stress responsive parameters as treatment progresses as a marker for progress. Here's a typical patient wearing psychophysiological recording sensors. This patient has muscle tension sensors on his forehead, a belt to pick up breathing around his chest, a temperature sensor for near surface blood flow on his pointer finger, and a heart rate sensor on his thumb. He would also have sensors for sweating mounted on his palm or fingers and sensors for brain waves in his hair. Examples of interventions incorporating biofeedback and associated techniques. The following are a few examples of how biofeedback is used to treat problems due to physiological dysfunctions. Some of the problems which can be helped through biofeedback based interventions include problems focusing thoughts for study, testing, and sports, lack of optimal performance in sports and music due to incorrect patterns of muscle tension, poor breathing, etc., tension headaches, migraine headaches, ADHD, irritable bowel syndrome, asthma, anxiety reactions, muscle use coordination dysfunctions due to accident stroke etc muscle pain in the jaws low back and shoulders and of course urinary and fecal incontinence migraine and tension headaches biofeedback based treatments for both migraine and tension headaches work large long-term follow-up studies show that muscle tension and temperature biofeedback is highly effective in preventing onset of migraine and tension headaches for at least 80% of those people who learn the skills and practice them. Headache activity is usually reduced from between 80% to entirely gone among those for whom the treatment works. There are no side effects and the treatments work as well as most medications. Adults and children who have diagnosed migraine and or tension headaches, which did not begin with a traumatic event, should consider muscle tension and temperature biofeedback. The treatment is likely to require about 10 weekly sessions, along with home practice. Treatment of muscle tension related jaw area pain. Jaw area pain is commonly caused by problems with the jaw joint.
that's TMJ, or the muscles which control jaw motion, that's TMD. When patients successfully learn to control jaw muscle tension through muscle tension biofeedback, both muscle tension and pain decrease among people with jaw muscle tension problems, but not for those with jaw joint problems. This treatment has been shown to be highly effective when used with people having jaw muscle problems. Renaud syndrome. In this disorder, people's hands and feet get very cold when exposed to cooling stresses, such as drafts or to psychological stresses. Their hands and feet become cold because the blood vessels leading to them spasm, which prevents blood from reaching them. Biofeedback of finger skin temperature is used to teach people with Raynaud's to warm their hands. Teaching people to raise and keep their baseline hand temperatures to near normal and to keep their hands warm even when they're under physical stresses such as a cool draft has proven to be a highly effective way to prevent onset of Raynaud's syndrome attacks. Low back pain caused by incorrect patterns and amounts of muscle tension is frequently referred to as musculoskeletal low back pain. Back pain can have innumerable causes which are frequently not detectable. Abnormal low back muscle tension frequently makes back pain worse or causes it in the first place. When the low back muscles are kept too tense for too long, either in response to pain of some other origin or problems with their own functioning, they hurt. People with muscle tension related low back pain have many different patterns of abnormal muscle tension, so it's crucial to identify the circumstances under which different muscles show abnormal patterns of activity. These patients improve when muscle tension biofeedback is used to teach them to recognize and maintain correct patterns and levels of tension. The treatment works to the extent that the incorrect patterns and levels of tension can be corrected. The portion of the pain due to non-muscular problems doesn't change much with muscle tension biofeedback. Biofeedback is commonly used in the treatment of pelvic floor pain and dysfunctions. It has been shown to be highly effective for urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence. It can be helpful in the treatment of constipation, PMS, dysmenorrhea, and vulvar stipulitis. Biofeedback for urinary incontinence. A small probe is placed into the vaginal canal or anus and the patient is trained to recognize incorrect levels and patterns of tensing. When the levels come up to normal and the patient tenses when appropriate, the problem generally goes away completely or nearly completely. Biofeedback for urinary incontinence really works. Good sized studies show that about a third of healthy young women leak so much during exercise that they don't do it. The majority of women leak for months to years after giving birth. Pelvic floor biofeedback can help most of these people. Not only that, the government approves coverage of this treatment. Assessment and tracking of muscle tension problems causing urinary incontinence. In this example, a woman with urge urinary incontinence is having her muscle tension recorded from her lower abdomen and her pelvic floor. The graph on the left shows the abnormal pre-training pattern of tensing, while the one on the right shows the normal pattern of tensing after training. The problem here is that before training the very large abdominal muscles tense up immediately when the person is told to tense only her pelvic floor. The pelvic floor muscles take a while to tense up and they can't maintain much tension. 
post-training, the pelvic floor muscles go up right away, sustain tension pretty smoothly, and go back down on command, while the abdomen does very little. Learning to control breathing patterns to run and think better, as well as be less anxious. The belts around the chest and abdomen respond to inhalation and exhalation. Up to half the people with anxiety disorders actually have a breathing disorder. When the breathing disorder is corrected using respiration biofeedback, the anxiety goes away with no further intervention. Biofeedback is frequently used to help people control their stress and anxiety. This is among the most common and successful uses of biofeedback. Heart rate variability feedback, respiration control training, and muscle tension recognition and control training all help people control anxiety. Which type of feedback is likely to work best? depends on a psychophysiological profile's determination of which physiological system is most reactive to stress. Hyperventilation and incorrect breathing patterns as causes of non-cardiac chest pain. The literature indicates that between 51 and 90 percent of non-cardiac related chest pain is associated with hyperventilation and incorrect sustained breathing patterns. Retraining breathing patterns and heart rate variability training results in long-term, at least three years, control of stress-related cardiac symptoms and hyperventilation-related symptoms such as anxiety and non-cardiac chest pain. This is an area where respiratory biofeedback and heart rate variability feedback are clearly effective. The psychophysiological assessment determines whether breathing problems and heart rate variability problems are present and whether they are related to stress responses. Irritable bowel syndrome is yet another problem that can be successfully treated using biofeedback. Specifically, heart rate variability biofeedback has been shown to be highly effective both on its own and as an adjunct to cognitive restructuring in the treatment of irritable bowel syndrome. This is another treatment that really works and has great evidence supporting it, so it should be used even more than it is. EEG biofeedback, also known as neurofeedback, is used to help people recognize how their minds are functioning. Biofeedback of EEG waves recorded from different parts of the brain can help people learn to focus better, be more aware of themselves, correct ADHD problems, reduce seizures, and control drug and alcohol addiction. ADHD. Small but excellent controlled and clinical studies show that neurofeedback significantly helps kids with ADHD who have math problems. Underlying problems with brainwave patterns include the idea that hyperkinetic kids with concentration problems produce too much theta and too little beta. The sensory motor rhythm is increased with inhibited movement. So, what we want to do is give hyperkinetic kids neurofeedback to increase SMR in order to decrease activity levels. Neurofeedback to decrease theta while increasing beta shows increased attention span and increased ability to learn math. Alcohol and drug abuse. The usual biofeedback based treatment includes temperature biofeedback and neurofeedback along with imagery and relaxation training. 
It has been tested with hardcore VA alcoholic drug addicts, prisoners, and many others in controlled and clinical studies. Five and ten year follow-ups show that the technique is highly effective. But a great many more studies are going to be needed before this is accepted by the general community. These were just a few of the problems biofeedback can be used to help correct. So what actually happens during a typical biofeedback session? Before the first biofeedback session, a physiological assessment is done so we know that some system is not working correctly. For example, we may have found that a patient habitually keeps her jaw a bit too tense much of the time, so she experiences jaw area pain. The aim of the biofeedback session would be to show her the abnormal level and teach her to relate the sensations from her jaw to actual levels of tension. Next, she will learn to control her jaw tension by watching the biofeedback display. The entire session would last about 20 minutes so she doesn't get fatigued and lose control of her muscles. She would be given homework to notice her jaw tension as she goes through her normal activities and learn to control the tension when it is inappropriately high for the circumstances. It may take 10 or more sessions for the treatment to produce optimal results. To do well with biofeedback, people need to learn the skills and continue to apply them. If the skills are not learned or not applied, the person won't get better or stay better even if the person has been shown and convinced that the problem is due to a controllable physiological dysfunction. Biofeedback is certainly not for everybody. Many people do not want to put effort into learning, practicing, and applying new skills. Many people do not want to believe that their actions cause some of their physical and mental problems. These people are not likely to do well at biofeedback. It's vital that you find out how solid the evidence is for effectiveness of any biofeedback-based intervention before you try it. The Association for Applied Psychophysiology and Biofeedback is the field's main professional organization. AAPB's website will guide you to the evidence for each disorder. Just look at the website aapb.org. How do you figure out who's likely to be competent to provide biofeedback-based interventions? The simplest way for a patient or referring clinician to know that a provider has at least minimal qualifications, training, and experience is to choose someone who's certified in biofeedback or one of its subspecialties, such as neurofeedback or pelvic floor disorders, by the Biofeedback Certification International Alliance. Interested in finding a certified biofeedback provider? Interested in becoming certified in biofeedback? Look on BCIA's website. Please remember that if a provider is offering to treat a clinically diagnosed problem, be sure the person has the appropriate training and state license or certification to treat that disorder. The Behavioral Medicine Research and Training Foundation gives fantastic distance home-based courses in biofeedback, neurofeedback pain, pelvic floor disorders, and many others to professionals who want to learn more about biofeedback and other behavioral techniques. If you're a clinician, coach, or educator, we can teach you how to integrate biofeedback into your practice. Interested? Please go to biofeedbacktraining.org to see a list of our courses and find out more about biofeedback training. This is the end of your introduction to biofeedback. Thanks very much for attending. Goodbye for now.